How did Shea Gilgis Alexander and the Thunder take a leap and make it into the postseason this year? Ryland Styles has got the answer. We'll talk about that next. Welcome to the Lockdown NBA Playoff Preview. I'm Nick Engstead of Lockdown NBA, and I'm joined by Ryland Styles of the Lockdown Thunder Podcast to tell you everything you need to know about the Oklahoma City Thunder that are now in the postseason, Ryland. Who would have thought at this point that this rebuilding disgrace of a franchise, giving like making it a bad name for the NBA with their tanking efforts, would be in the postseason? Uh, besides that, the the rebuilding, the not rebuilding anymore story, the you know the come up of the rock of the Thunder. What's the biggest on court story for the Thunder this season? I think the biggest on-court story for the Thunder this season is not only SGA stardom, but how good they've been collectively. This team last year was the 30th offensive rating. That's now up to 16th. 27th defensive rating, that's now up to 13th. And they've had a plus nine overall net improvement for the net rating, up to 15th from 27th. And even without SGA on this team, if you were just looking at his off-the-court numbers on the on-off stats, this team would be pacing for a 35-win pace, and they do not have a single top five pick on the floor. Chet Holmgren's the only top five pick of the rebuild, and he has not played yet. So it's been a collective effort of both guys like Josh Giddy and J-Dub taking massive leaps and, and, and bursting onto the scene, as well as Sam Presti finding value with Aaron Wiggins at the 55th overall pick, with Isaiah Joe just off the scrap heat two days before the season started. He was cut by Philadelphia, Vince Rossman, Came to OKC this summer from Philadelphia's front office to Oklahoma City's front office. They pick up Isaiah Joe, and Isaiah Joe is one of the best shooters in the NBA. So this team is more than SGA, which I don't think many people realize. This team is not too different from last year, too. You mentioned the different kind of like uh, like upgrades that they did, both in the offense and the defensive end. And this team is not too different, right? You talk about Jalen Williams, Isaiah Joe. Is this team? How is this team any different than last year? It's just the summer of development. There's two Jalen Williamses in town. There's Isaiah Joe in town. And then that's it. They swap Baisley uh, and Muscala out. They got Dario Saric back uh, from those two trades uh, total. And then it's just been their guys progressing. I mean, Aaron Wiggins, a 55th overall pick, looks like a really nice rotational piece. Uh, Kenneth Williams took another step. Even Pokashevsky, before his injury, he looked like a rotational NBA player, which is not some uh, great superstar by any means, but he looked competent, which is more than you can say over his first couple of seasons in the NBA. So it's just internal development and getting these guys all on the same page. What is the playoff rotation for the Thunder? Let's just start with this first game against the Pelicans. Who do you expect to play? And is there anyone on the bubble right now? Yeah, I think that it's a pretty cut and dry rotation for OKC. It'll be their starting five, SGA, Josh Giddy, Lou Dort, Jalen Williams, and Jalen Williams. And then off the bench, it'll be Wiggins and Joe. And those are your seven who are going to play. Now you're going to need a little bit more bodies than that. So throw in 10 minutes or so for Sarich. And then maybe you sneak in uh, uh, Lindy Waters the third onto the court a couple of times. Mark likes to do this whole uh, put shooters in there. If there's like a dead ball with 11 seconds left, throw in a shooter, see if he can give you a spark and kind of a scramble play in those settings. So maybe he gets in a bit. And he's a guy that like, if you give him five minutes, he might hit two threes in those five minutes. So if you just need bodies on such a shallow rotation, uh, it can actually pay dividends for you. So that's what I would expect that we're going to see on Wednesday against New Orleans. As a team, what are their biggest strengths and weaknesses? Basically, how do they win games and how do they lose games this season? Yeah, losing games is is pretty easy to describe because they've lost games, one, because of their lack of size. So uh, offensive rebounds have killed this team over and over and over again this season. And then rebounds just in general have killed this team. And then, of course, whenever your tallest player is listed at 6'10", uh, that's actually active and, and playing NBA games right now, uh, it, it, you know, dominant big men can impose their will a bit uh, on this team. Now, luckily, even though Valanciunas is a good player, but they're not going to pivot from the way that they play basketball and just feed him all game. So they got a little bit of a break there compared to, say, playing Cat or somebody else uh, in this game. And then the only other way we've seen them lose games is by – uh, a lack of effort, a lack of energy, like they dropped those games against the Hornets and they dropped that game against the Pacers last week. So overall, there has not been much that gives this team trouble besides just the obvious answer of lacking size. One thing that has been um, consistent is zone. If you go into a zone against this Thunder offense, especially uh, if you can disrupt Shea, there's not much left to do because this team does not have enough shooters. So you go into a zone and even if you make the right passes and decisions and get an open corner three-pointer, that corner shooter is going to be Lou Dort or Josh Giddy or someone who you do not trust to hit it more often than not. And, and so 
defensively, you live with that. Because if if Lou Dort does have a four point thir- third quarter like he has before against the Nets, then you live with it and tip your cap and move on. But off, more often than not, he's not going to have that sort of breakout. And you live with, with kind of limiting SGA as the Jazz did this week, as the Heat have done this season, as many teams have done with that zone defense. So those are some of the negatives that have happened for OKC. But the overwhelming positive is their ability to just scrap and and move the ball and move your defense. Ball movement, backdoor cuts, all these little actions keep you working uh, every second of that 48-minute game, and eventually they can wear you down. Plus, SGA is just an elite, top-tier, tough shot maker while remaining historic, you know, efficiently at a historic clip. So it's been great to see this Thunder team kind of get this experience, but there's some obvious deficiencies that New Orleans could take advantage of. SGA is maybe the most improved player this season. He may end up winning that award. He's definitely going to be top two in that. Uh, on FanDuel, he's, he's top two odds. What has he gotten better at the most? Like, what's the one thing that you look at and say, man, he's night and day different from last season to this season? Well, it's been a cat, a myriad of things where you just kind of look at it and say everything. But specifically, uh, the the efficiency has been there for SGA for his career. He's he's gone 50% now twice in his career from the floor, 47% once, 45% another time, and another 47%. So he's been efficient his whole career. But it's just been the volume, but specifically on offense, his playmaking is a lot better. And so then that really keeps defenders on their toes. He's a better ball handler. He's a better passer. And so you just have no way to truly defend him and and know what to do. Uh, He's a more explosive player at the rim. He has a career high in dunks this year. Uh, So that's helped him a lot too, because he can either come at you full force, full head of steam, or stop on a dime and hit the mid range at an elite level. I think that overall for his total game, it's been Stunning to see a guy who averages 30 points on a team in which he's not even challenged as the best player. He's clearly and totally the number one player, but he still locks in defensively and gets over a steal per game and a block per game uh, on the defensive end. Synergy ranks SGA as an, as an excellent defender in the 87th percentile. Like he's a really, really good defender playing in the past lanes, getting deflections with his length. And that's why the Thunder have been one of the top half of the league defenses for a lot of the season, despite not having an anchor, not having a big man. It's been because everyone buys into disrupting offenses and doing their job and swarming the ball. And so they, for a long time this year, had led the league in turnovers forced. Uh, They still are up there in that category right now. And that's a large part due to SGA's commitment to the defensive end whenever nobody would blame him if he was lackadaisical on that end because of what he gives you offensively. But being crafty around the rim uh, and a mixture of being crafty and powerful around the rim allows him to draw fouls. It allows him to to score at a high clip. Uh, And the one thing that has not improved this year is his three-point shooting. It's actually, compared to some years, gotten worse at 34% from three. So if he unlocks that three ball again, then this can be a really scary score. Unlocks the three. He averaged 31 points a game this season, Ryland. Like, he, he I know. know. <laughs> if he unlocks the three and scores at all three levels, we could be talking 32, 33. Who oh knows? Oh, my goodness. Uh, we know the expectations for the Thunder before the season. What are the expectations for the Thunder now from let's let's do three levels? The fans, the team itself, what are you hearing from them? And then for you, what are their expectations going into this play-in and going into the postseason? Yeah, I think that everyone, for the most part, has a pretty level-headed uh expectation for this team surprisingly which is not common with fandoms and everything else the team for themselves they wanted this moment but they have not you know they have not sacrificed anything to get to this moment they, they've played their style of basketball both with uh, on the court production and with rotations and, and get in finding minutes for development for Usman Jang and other guys down the stretch of this year even in some must-win games but ultimately the players wanted this a lot. You saw their reaction on social media of how badly they wanted this and SGA posting on Instagram, how he kept the receipts of people saying that they would tank and, <laughs> and everything that went on with it. So the team wanted it. Uh, obviously competitors are going to say that they can do anything uh, imaginable and, and win any series and become the, we believe thunder and take over that, that eight seed upset. But the reality is no 10 seed has ever won a game in the play in tournament. And if this team were to lose on Wednesday, it's still a wildly successful season and, and, and a incredible uh, hat tip to these guys who, as you said, were basically the entire roster from last year is just back and, and improving outside of J-Dub, who's been arguably their second best player on this roster. So it's been great to see. I think that the team expects that they'll just go out there and compete and throw their best punch. That's kind of been the buzzword around the team since they got in. And from the fan base perspective, I think everyone's pretty understandable that like the ceiling of this team would be you find a way to survive in advance because basketball is crazy and you're going to only play a one game sample size twice. And so if you upset two teams, then you get into a playoff series and kind of kind of take a breath, so to say, in Denver. 
And then you play a hard fought scrappy game. I think that this team, if they're able to survive the play in tournament could go and, and give Denver to push the same way that Memphis did against Utah, uh, their first year in the postseason, where Memphis didn't win the series and they stole a game and John ja had that baseline dunk. And he, he kind of announced himself, but we all knew, even though they didn't win the series, they were coming and there were going to be a, a good team sooner rather than later. So that's the ceiling for this Thunder team. And even with the loss on Wednesday, it's still great experience. And it's outside of just this one game. They've played like 44 clutch time games this year as a, as the youngest roster in the NBA and the second youngest roster in NBA history. Now they get a game where you can no longer act like you're not game planning for it. They're going to study a game plan for once and actually go out there and see how do we execute a game plan? How do we prepare for an NBA team, not prepare for a season, not prepare for how we can improve individually and internally. You're now working externally, which they have not done yet this, you know, this entire time. Like they, they have not had this group practice on how to beat a team externally and not how to fix their own problems internally. So I'm interested to see how they react to that. But ultimately people are just along for the ride this year. Now, next year, those expectations, I think with Chet Holmgren back, will will ratchet up a bit. For, but for now, everyone's just playing it cool and, and riding the wave. As someone that covers the Mavericks, enjoy these moments when there are no expectations because as soon as there are, you never know what could happen. Uh, the FanDuel spread for the game right now is uh, the Thunder are a five-point underdog, so we'll see what happens if they can do all those things against the Pelicans to get a win, be the first 10 seed to win in the play-in. You'll have us covered over on Locked on Thunder. Go follow Ryland Styles. Uh, five days a week on Locked on Thunder and then all throughout the postseason and offseason. Guys, thanks so much for hanging out with us on the Locked on NBA Playoff Preview.